the last time I saw him, he had his uh, boat in town, and it was docked uh, on the in the Hudson, and uh, invited me and uh, my wife to to go down there for dinner. I was so nervous because I, the last thing I wanted to do was was let Johnny see through me because I knew I was an imposter, and and I just I just thought I. I'm gonna, you know, knock something over. I'll fall overboard. I'll, I'll, something will happen. Uh, I'll cause the engine to explode. We'll all drown. It'll just because I have screwed up Johnny's yacht. So we got on the boat at dusk. The boat was named the Serengeti, and we went. Uh, first, we went north, uh, up the Hudson, uh, under the uh, George Washington Bridge, which was a thrill. And now the dusk is turning to darkness, and we then went south, and then we went up the East River. And I'll never forget coming back down the East River. We're looking right at the Statue of Liberty, which is brightly illuminated. And then we turn around, and we're staring now uh, up at the southern tip of Manhattan uh, at a, it was, I think it was September. Um, and this, uh, the lights coming over and replacing the sunlight as it slid down in the west. It, it was just stunning perspective I'd, I'd never experienced before. Uh, so that was cool. You know, it's, I guess it's the same thing you get on the circle line. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, I can remember talking to Johnny, and uh, I, I never knew what to say to Johnny, so I always went to Jack Benny because I knew he loved Jack Benny. So I, got, I started getting him talking about Jack Benny, and he could tell one Jack Benny story after another, uh, and that was, that was good. That, that, I think, made him comfortable and certainly it was very entertaining. Bob Wright, uh, who was running NBC at the time, it was his, it was the his fiftieth birthday party. I went to this event, and there's Johnny Carson, and um, I'm introduced to him, and he was very reserved, very quiet, and when we spoke. He was very, uh, I thought, uh, uh, he's very reserved, and then I went up and did my thing, and it went fine. Then he went up and did his thing. Obviously, it was amazing. And then it was over, and I think he was done. He was, so he was sort of relaxed, and he just came over to me and just said, because um, there was a lot of attention, who is this Conan O'Brien, and how is this going to work, and how is he going to replace David Letterman? And he came over to me and he said, just be yourself, which sounds so easy. And it sounds like such simple advice, but, you know, it's the best advice you'll ever get. He said, just be yourself. It's the only way it can work. What I always hit my ear is that he didn't say, just be yourself and it will work, because he's being honest with me. He doesn't know me. He's not gonna tell me, just be yourself and you'll be fine. He said, just be yourself. It's the only way it can work. I don't know if it will, but if you have any chance at all, it's being yourself. And uh, early on when I was so hyper self-conscious and, and self-critical and other people are very critical, I remembered there was this period where I had to consciously remembered, I'm not gonna, I can't get rid of all my idiosyncrasies. They're just there and I have to go with them. And uh, I'll get rid of some <laughs> that are really annoying, but I get to keep the other ones and this is just who I am. And if it doesn't work, what else are you gonna do? Uh, I'll do something else. I'll sell lawnmowers, um, which I did recently. <laughs> Seinfeld called me up and he said, Johnny called me and he said, see if you and Shanley want to go to dinner. Well, I'd never gone to dinner with Johnny in all these years of doing the show. And we had a ball. We went to a dinner in Malibu, some little fish place, tiny place. Jerry and I are still like children, still like children around Johnny. He's still the king. And uh, whatever he drank, we drank. Whatever he ordered, we ordered. And he was just charming and you know much more uh smart alec it was it was right around 2000 and uh hilarious and i think he appreciated that we were you know appreciative to him and we were able to be uh respectful to him and he pontificated about uh uh where television was going that it was going to turn tabloid it was going to be tabloid television everything in the media was going to turn tabloid and it was going to be uh, shit, and uh... I do remember him saying something about how the unpredictability of show business and how when word got out that Lawrence Welk was getting his own TV show, that that was riotous. 
No, they thought, what an absurd idea to give this guy, who can't even talk English properly, his own show. This will be off the air in one night. And he said, that's, that's how show business goes. You can never predict, you know, what's going to work with the public. Johnny Carson said, so we'll be right back with comedian Drew Carey. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for the commercial and I'm getting myself psyched up. Curtain opens. You know, Johnny Carson introduces me. The curtain opens. And it's just like I dreamed it. It's just exactly like I dreamed it. I go on a stage. I hit the mark. You know, I'm nervous leading up to it, but I'm excited. And I remember watching the week before and watching Drew Carey. And it's beautiful because Johnny's there. Ed's there and Doc is there, like the big three. I think I was scheduled to be on that week and a couple weeks before, a month before, they said we're moving it to the 15th. I remember seeing Doc laughing and Johnny laughing and Ed laughing and I remember seeing Johnny Carson holding onto the desk. He's holding onto the desk because he's laughing so hard so he doesn't fall off the chair because he's like, he's like convulsing. So I remember watching Drew Carey the week before and he crushed. It was unbelievable. And I believe Johnny called him over. And he goes like this. And I go, who, me? And he goes, yeah, you. And I, I'm like, oh, no, nobody gets called over for the Tonight Show. That's a big thing. And I remember thinking, that was supposed to be my spot. <laughs> I was happy for Drew. I was thinking, that would have been my audience. You know, whatever. And I get a phone message over the weekend from Ray Romano. And the message was, hey, Drew, this is Ray. Thanks for taking all the laughs. Click. <laughs> and I look to Johnny, and Johnny gives me one of these, you know? And look, one of these from Johnny's is, is the greatest thing in the world. Drew Carey got called over, but I'm the most negative guy, and I can always look at the bad side of things. Getting one of these from Johnny was one of the greatest things in, in my career, you know? You know, it's funny. I, 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 you see this? Can, can you get a close-up of this? Can you see that? Now, we know Jesus didn't wear a tie. This is Johnny's tie. And how I got it is interesting. This is, it. I always carry this with me. This is a, the Fisher Space Pen, the, the pen that they took to the moon. But these, these were my favorite things to give out because this space pen was devised to write, under, uh, to write upside down, and it, it's got a special uh, fluid in it, and whatever. We did about three minutes on the space pen, and I think it was Johnny who says, a uh, silver suppository. It's very good, you know, <laughs> very, very elegant. You know? And I think I said, and I wanted something from him. And I think he either gave me this tie or I stole the tie. I don't like to do these things. I'm asked every day, Dartmouth University, why are Jews in comedy? We're doing a documentary. I don't know. You know, there's always some documentary, either BBC, somewhere. Why is comedy? Why did comedy start? Was there comedy in, you know? I don't want to do that. I don't care, you know? Uh, well, is it Jewish or is it just New York? Oh, yeah. You know, get out of here. Leave me alone. I, you know, enough documentaries, and they always want me to contribute to a documentary, and I always say, off. I was taping in California something. Johnny found out about it. Phone rang. Richard, want to go to the Magic Castle tonight or go to a restaurant? I said, to a restaurant. And he told me where to go, where to meet him. Taping broke down, sudden nightmare. Everything went wrong. He had left. I knew he had left. I couldn't get there. There were no cell phones. Somehow I got him at the restaurant, and I said, I'm just leaving now. And I'm sorry, I blew the evening, and maybe somebody said, just come ahead, Richard. So we came, I came ahead. I had said to him on the phone, knowing I was late for our restaurant date, they've locked my clothes up. I just have old stuff on and some white running shoes. I said, that's all right, come on ahead, Richard. Another hour in traffic, finally got there, dark restaurant. I look around and I realize he was right to leave. It's so long, so late. And then I saw a figure at the bar, beautifully dressed, male. And I walked over, and there he was, nursing a ginger ale and wearing white running shoes. 
<laughs> Larry King pronounced that a great story when Johnny died. Um, somebody said, that's improbable. I mean, how's a guy sitting in a restaurant going to get? I said, if you're Johnny Carson, you want white running shoes, you're going to have them wherever you are in 20 minutes. <laughs> He got him. It was, he was so proud of his joke, it was touching. So I came out and I did my spot with Johnny and we talked. And then I moved over and then I think it was probably a girl singer. And then she sat down and I moved. So now I'm next to Ed at the very end of the couch. And there was a clock uh, that Johnny would look at from time to time to see how much time there was left. <laughs> but, and it, but it didn't have a glass face on it. So he had, he had this author on and... Um, and it was a particularly boring author that, that he had on. <clears throat> and um, I would look at him, and he would look over at the clock, and then uh, he'd start talking to the author again. And it got duller and duller. And every time Johnny looked away, I nudged Ed. I said, move it, move the hands back, you know, move it back. <clears throat> so he, Ed would move it back five minutes. So Johnny would have this conversation, and then he'd look over at the clock. <laughs> And he'd get this expression on his face. <coughs> you mean I, I got 10 more minutes with this guy, you know? So the next time I did the show, they had a glass, they'd put a glass face on it. So, so no one could move back the hands of time. Dad would bring him home on Friday night from work. So they'd be on the train from New York to Philadelphia. And I had the master bedroom at that point. So my father would wake me up and move me into my sister's room so that Johnny could have my room because it had its own bathroom and a balcony and overlooked a pool. After this had happened about four times, now I was in, you know, seventh or eighth grade. After this had happened four times, he wrote and signed an 8 by 10 photo of himself and said, to Claudia, sometime you must come sleep in my bed you know, love Johnny Carson. And I went running up to dad and said, do you believe Mr. Carson invited me over for a sleepover? And so dad and Johnny got a real big laugh out of that. You know, when he retired, you know, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm taking magic lessons. <laughs> and he was taking magic lessons. So he did, he did love to do uh, magic tricks. And he would do them. You know, we had a, we shared a poker game. Uh, it was some great, great comedians, and, and he loved to do that, and he loved to tell stories about the show. He really did enjoy that show. He was thrilled to have met the people that he met like a kid. He really did. And, uh, you know, one, one of my favorite jokes that he did on in his monologue, because, the, the, you know, the reputation he had as a person and the, and the uh, reality of him as a person was two different things. And I think he had, well, I'll tell the joke. He came out one night and he said, there was a story in the newspaper today that said I was thinking of writing an autobiography. And seven publishing companies went out and copyrighted the title, Cold and Aloof. <laughs> Uh, but I, I interpreted his personality as not cold and aloof, but as polite. And he was a gentleman, and he was not, you know, people, when they meet celebrities, they, they interpret them in a, in a half a second. They don't think, might be having a bad day, <clears throat> might be thinking about something else, might have something on his mind, uh, might be sick. Uh, might be driving to work. So the immediate response is what the person thinks of a celebrity. It's, gee, he wasn't very friendly or whatever or whatever, or, you know, or, and Johnny was just polite. He took time to get to know people like a normal person would. So when Melissa was born, we wrapped her up in a blanket and we sent her in with the nurse to the office. And she said, Mr. Carson, this is for you. And she handed him Melissa, and he truly, <laughs> we didn't know that in those days. He was already having a good time on the side. He was a little upset there when somebody handed him a baby. And then, of course, he read the note, and it said, my name is Melissa Rosenberg. I am so-and-so. My mother and father wanted to give you the best thing they could. Please bring me up Jewish. <laughs> 
Now that I was the leader of the band, I decided, well, what will I wear? Why would I think that? I don't know, but uh, the leader of a big band always used to wear something different than the guys in the band. And about the time this all took place, you had the uh, revolution on campuses, and uh, the rock era was beginning with the wild clothes and the Beatles. The next thing I know, I'm <clears throat> in a clothing store in in downtown Manhattan that sold some pretty wild stuff. And I bought some of it and wore it on the show. And Johnny had some very pithy comments. <laughs> and he had a great deal of fun with it. And it became a thing. And finally, one day, I, I got tired of buying all these crazy clothes, and I showed up in a blue suit. And <laughs> after the show, they told me that in the meeting after the show, I also didn't go to that meeting. Uh, they, Johnny says, well, what the hell was it with Doc tonight? What the hell, wearing a blue suit like that? That's horrible. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. What the hell's he doing dressing like that? So the producer came and told me what Johnny said, and I never wore a blue suit again till today. <laughs> <laughs>